So by now you've probably seen the gorgeous array of first science images released by NASA from the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST. And I think when they were first released yesterday, we were all just a little bit overwhelmed and a little bit lost for words. Stefan's Quintet. Whoa. And oh my oh. gosh. Javon, what are we looking at? Whoa. Yes, like you said. But now I've had time to just, you know, soak in all the atmosphere and take it all in. So let's dive into the science. What are we seeing and what can we learn from these images? Let's start with this spectacular image of the Carina Nebula. Now the amount of people that have already told me they have this as their phone or their desktop background already is incredible. So this is a huge star forming region in our own galaxy of stars, the Milky Way, and it's about 7,000 light years away. So all stars are formed in these giant gas clouds that are also really dusty as well. So they have these heavier elements, the heavier molecules, bigger molecules, the likes of carbon, and nitrogen and other metals as well that are there because other stars have lived and died in that region of space before. So when they've gone supernova and, and thrown off all of their uh, outer layers, they've essentially polluted space from being pristine hydrogen gas and adding in all of this carbon and nitrogen oxygen that's formed in this uh, fusion process inside of stars. The problem with that is that dust, these heavier, bigger molecules tend to block the shorter wavelengths of visible light that we see with our eyes and the likes of the Hubble Space Telescope. But dust doesn't block longer wavelengths of light in the infrared. The infrared light essentially goes around all of these larger dust molecules and also in even longer wavelengths into what we call the mid infrared, dust actually glows in those wavelengths as well. And these are the wavelengths that the James Webb Space Telescope can detect. So this is an image taken by the near cam detector on JWST. It's that near infrared wavelengths, the sort of slightly longer than visible wavelengths. So we can finally see through the dust for the first time, see those newly forming stars along with structure in the gas which is resolved in such incredible detail. If you compare this to the Hubble Space Telescope images that we had before which are only in visible light it almost looks really flat in comparison almost two-dimensional. Then we've also got this composite image of what NearCam saw and also the MIRI detector on board JWST. So this is the mid-infrared wavelengths as well so we're also seeing this ethereal glow of the dust actually emitting these longer wavelengths of infrared light too. And what I love about this image is that you can almost see this haze rising off the top of this dust and gas at the top of the nebula. And it's essentially gas streaming off it as this is all heated up by the UV radiation from these very young stars. It's also why you see these big caves around stars too, and then these big pillars of gas and dust as well as it tries to escape from these very hot regions around the stars. So images like this help us to better understand how stars form and all of the steps in that process as well, especially pinpointing the moment that the stars become visible in visible light that we can see with our own eyes and with the likes of the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, by the time that they've actually thrown off all the gas and dust around them by heating those surrounding regions. And that's incredibly important when we look at galaxies as a whole. And we say, okay, if there's this much light there, then there must be this many stars there giving off that amount of light and then we can estimate the total mass in stars in the galaxy. But of course, if some of that light is shrouded by dust for some of the newly formed stars, then we need to know what fraction of that amount of light is missing so we can correct our estimate for the total amount of stars in a galaxy. Next up, my personal favorite of all the images released, Stefan's Quintet. But maybe I'm biased because I study galaxies and they're growing supermassive black holes and this is exactly what this image shows. This is a very dense cluster of five galaxies about 250 million light years away that are all interacting. And JWST has essentially revealed the effects of that interaction. So here again, we have a composite image. So it's both what near cam sees in the near infrared seeing through the dust of the stars in the galaxies overlaid with what Miri sees where you see the dust glowing in those mid-infrared wavelengths. And the thing that blew my mind the most was that you can see individual stars in this galaxy on the left-hand side. It is absolutely unreal that it can do that. Like if you think about how small those stars actually are at that huge distance, it really showcases how powerful JWST actually is. You can also see that in the space between the galaxies, there's this glowing dust that's obviously been torn off these bottom two galaxies and also up here too in this galaxy. It causes this galaxy to look like what's known as a jellyfish galaxy, which are some of my absolute favorites. 
And then if you just look at what Miri saw alone, it's especially spectacular as well. It shows the structure in the dust in these galaxies, which is also really important for knowing, well, where are stars going to form in these dusty regions? You can also spot a dwarf galaxy here overlaid with this big one, but also see this giant bright thing, which is the, the thing that got me most excited because what this is, is a growing supermassive black hole at the very center of this galaxy. Essentially there is hydrogen gas spiraling around this black hole, which is accelerated to huge speeds so that it gets incredibly hot and it starts to glow, especially in infrared wavelengths as well, making it incredibly bright when Miri looks at it and revealing it in all of its glory. Now, I know the images are possibly the most exciting part for everyone else, but for me, I got excited by the spectrum of light from this growing supermassive black hole that Miri took as well. You eventually split the light into its component wavelengths and you see these peaks where you've got this glowing gas, either from hydrogen or neon or whatever it might be, orbiting that black hole. This is what actually allows us to get at the mass of the supermassive black hole as well. Plus, we also have what's known as a data cube. We don't just get a spectrum at every pixel, but we can also think about it as getting an image at every single wavelength as well. So you can isolate just the molecular hydrogen, so H2, two atoms of hydrogen bonded together, and say, where is that in the galaxy? And you, and you can see that this hydrogen has made this ring around the supermassive black hole as well. That was absolutely amazing to see. Like we have never, ever seen data like that before because we've never had a mid-infrared instrument on a telescope that's had that resolving power to see such small and detailed things on the sky. So I feel like that got lost in the live stream yesterday a little bit, but personally it was my favorite thing to come out of all of the science images that were dropped yesterday. Next up, let's head back into our galaxy, the Milky Way, to this, the Southern Ring Nebula, the remnant of a sun-like star 2,000 light years away that has poofed off its outer layers into space when it's run out of fuel and it's left behind its core that's still glowing in the middle known as a white dwarf. Again, this image is from the NearCam instrument. So these are the near infrared wavelengths where you can see through the dust to all that structure in the glowing gas. And it's this structure that tells us the history of this system from, you know, every pulse of the star when it died to the, the temperature of the white dwarf in the center now. And the colors here tell you how hot the different parts of the nebula are. So blue is the shorter infrared wavelengths, which are hotter and red are the longer wavelengths, which are cooler. What amazes me as you look at this image, which is, you know, focusing on something in the Milky Way is the amount of then background galaxies, billions of light years that you can then pick out in the background of the image that weren't the, you know, the main science focus of this image, but it's like bonus stuff in the background. Like there's three background galaxies in this top left corner alone. Again, we also have an image of the Southern Ring Nebula that's been taken with the MIRI detector as well, those mid infrared wavelengths where we see the emission from the dust itself. And the big surprise here was that there's actually two stars in the middle. The second that we couldn't see in the first image was shrouded in thick dust. So we could only we spotted it when we looked at it with Miri and we saw it glowing. This is actually the white dwarf. And the other star, which is the star we also see in the near cam image, is actually still a star that's happily living its life. It's happily burning hydrogen into helium still. It's not yet run out of fuel. So it's probably a fairly small, cooler star, you know, that's not shed its outer layers yet. But the interaction of these two things is they orbit each other. It's what's created these looping patterns in the dust and the gas. Then we've got this image of the galaxy cluster SMACS 0723, the light from which left 4.5 billion years ago, which is magnifying and lensing these background galaxies, which you can see are redder and they're stretched out. And the light from those galaxies has been traveling anywhere from probably 11 to 13 billion years before it got to us. You can also see lots of like bright stars in the foreground as well that are in our own Milky Way galaxy much closer to us. And like with the Southern Ring Nebula before, I feel like you could just keep looking at this image for hours and hours, keep finding something new and something new to say about that new object you found as well. It feels like, you know, in the background of JDWST images, there's no longer gonna be like any blank sky or empty space. There's always gonna be something to look at. 
I actually want to highlight in this image this faint glow around that central galaxy cluster. That's actually known as intracluster light. It's the gas and dust between the galaxies that's glowing very, very faintly, but JWST has managed to pick it up. And because this cluster is so massive, it bends space and can act as a lens, brightening and magnifying the light from the background galaxies in the same way that if you take a stemmed wine glass and pass it in front of the light from, say, a candle, the light from that candle will get bent into these arcs. And from the positions and shapes of all of these stretched out arcs that we see across this image, we can essentially make what's called a lensing map to then work out, well, where is all of the matter distributed in this cluster? Essentially get a map of where all of the mass is. And there's always more matter than we can see in the light, even correcting for, for dust, which we know is shrouding some of the light, which is what the, the mirror image of the same cluster can reveal to us as well. Even correcting for that, there's way more mass here than we can see. And so, yeah, this is just more evidence for dark matter. So this image being much more precise than the previous image we had of this patch of sky with the Hubble Space Telescope allows us a much more precise lensing map and a more accurate dark matter fraction and knowledge of where the dark matter is distributed to. Also, I really enjoyed the chat that we had on our big sort of collaboration Slack channel as well on the day that this was released because we started zooming into some of these background galaxies and we spotted that some have this distinctive eight point spike shape that's inherent in JWST images that I've explained before on this channel. I'll, I'll link that video down below. And essentially by spotting that, we know there's something very bright in the center of those galaxies, bright enough to cause that sort of distinctive eight point uh, pattern that's caused by light uh, traveling through uh, the optics of the telescope. And so we know there must be, again, a growing supermassive black hole in the center of these systems, like what we saw in that mirror image of Stefan's quintet before, but perhaps just not quite as bright. And if we consider the distances involved here, again, it's just incredible that JWST has been able to pick out that that is there, even at those distances, considering the fact that I mean, it would be faint to other telescopes, but apparently not to JWST. NASA also released some near spec spectrum of a few galaxies in this image as well. And those we really drooled at, like the amount of detail is incredible. And it's uh, what allows you to, to pinpoint the distance that the light has traveled from these galaxies and how much it's been redshifted by. I mean, they're so much sharper than even a spectrum you would get of a very nearby galaxy from like a ground-based telescope as well. Again, just revealing what JWST is capable of. So essentially all of us can just you know, go and squirrel ourselves away and work out, well, how do I want to use JWST now, now that I know what it can do to help me answer some of the, the science questions that I'm trying to answer in my own research. And lastly, this beautiful graph of the exoplanet WASP-96b. <laughs> You know, it might not have looked that spectacular to the general public, but all those astrophysicists wanted was the graphs. <laughs> this one shows the amount of light at each wavelength in the infrared range detected in the light from a star that has passed through an exoplanet's atmosphere. So a planet orbiting another star in our galaxy, the Milky Way. This one's called WASP-93b. It's what's known as a hot Jupiter. So it's something that's Jupiter-sized, but orbiting really close into its star. It actually only takes three days for it to fully go around its star instead of, you know, the 365 days that it takes Earth to go around the sun. So this graph charts how much light has been blocked by molecules in this exoplanet's atmosphere, absorbing away a tiny little bit of energy at a specific wavelength that is unique to that element. So if you spot that there has been some light blocks at that wavelength, you know it was that molecule that's done the blocking and the absorbing. So when we look at this, we see all these lumps and bumps where more light has been blocked because there's water vapor present in the atmosphere of this hot Jupiter. And there's loads of things that you can tell by looking at this graph. You can actually measure the temperature of the atmosphere of the planet because the hotter the atmosphere is, the bigger those peaks will be because there'll be more absorption. So in this planet's case, WASP 93b, the temperature is a balmy 725 degrees Celsius. Plus the shape of these bumps and the slopes at either end tell us there's also clouds and haze in the atmosphere of this planet too. So there's loads of things that we can learn by looking at this graph, not least the fact that there's water vapor present in a Jupiter-sized 
sun-sized planet that close into its star, right? it's got to be really hot. It suggests that, you know, water might be more prolific than we originally thought. And water, you know, is the basis for all life on Earth as we know it, at least as well. So that's an exciting thought. I think the hope is that in the future, we'll get a, a similar spectrum for an Earth-like planet too, maybe around a sun-like star, which would be very exciting to see if we could, you know, spot the same uh, molecules that are present in Earth's atmosphere. So that could be, you know, uh, water again, ozone, methane, carbon dioxide, those kind of things. We hopefully won't have to wait long for that because all of the data from the early release science program, so those proposals that got lucky to uh, get picked to have their data taken first, that's all going to be released on Thursday and it's raw format as well. So not just like JPEGs and PNGs that were released uh, yesterday, but the raw kind of data that we can download, get our hands on, start playing around with and see what we can find. I mean, what's truly remarkable though about all these images is that this was all achieved in just one week. You know, the telescope didn't need to sit there staring at one patch of sky for an overly long amount of time to collect enough light to get this amount of detail, you know, compared to the Hubble Space Telescope, which can stare at the same patch of sky for days, if not weeks, to get some of the most distant and oldest light in the universe. So I think we need to be prepared for this constant influx of data that we're going to be getting from JWST in the next few weeks, months, years. And I, for one, cannot wait to see what it reveals. To commemorate the release of these first science images from JWST, my sister has put together a new merch design for you all with that hexagon pattern of the iconic primary mirror embedded with the five main science images released. And I am in love. I've already got a t-shirt on order, but you can get it on a jumper, a hoodie, or a tote bag too. The link to my merch store is in the video description down below. Plus T-Mill, who I sell my merch with, are doing a buy one, get one tree promotion this weekend. So anytime from Friday, to Sunday if you buy anything they will plant a tree in your name which I think is brilliant anyway now roll those bloopers it's a very dense cluster of five galaxies just 250 million light years away from earth just 250 million light years I love it when I say it. like people are like just really but it is just in the grand scheme of the universe anyway then we've got, next up, we've got this image of SMAX 07. No, I probably shouldn't call it SMAX. <laughs> That's just what I call it. I'm pretty sure it's S-M-A-C-S, -S, but I just read it as SMAX, you know? It's, it's an image of SMAX. It's SMAX. <laughs> this just reminds me of that meme that's like, look at this graph. <laughs> Every time I do a spot, it's to a vapor. No, it really doesn't fit, does it? <laughs> I'll keep trying. <laughs> 